right, and you're on in three, two, one. Good morning, church. It's Pastor John here. Welcome to our 11 a.m. English ministry service. Uh, now, last week, we were actually live streaming from church, but due to some technology problems uh, with NBN, we are remote Zooming. So even if technology at times is frustrating, we're also thankful for the technology which allows us to actually meet together like this. So uh, even if there's uh, minuses, there can be pluses. It is great for us to uh, continue to meet together. This morning, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as we continue in our series of 1 Corinthians. And we have a guest preacher this morning who is uh, familiar to some of us from last year, Sam Wan. So looking forward to hearing from Sam. And we'll uh, meet him. For those of us who haven't met him uh, early in the service, uh, we'll find out about how he's been and that, that will be great to catch up with him. Well, as we meet together, we look to the great things of God a God who even in the midst of problems and difficulties in his church and even in the world, one who is sovereign, one who his purposes are never thwarted, one whose power and goodness comes together in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be looking to uh, the centre of God's love as we look at what Christ has done and what that means for life in the here and now, even in difficulties and trials we remember from 1 Corinthians 6 that we are not our own. We are bought with a price, uh, the precious blood of Jesus. Well, let me uh, begin in prayer as we uh, begin our time of meeting together. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for your sovereignty, your goodness, your power, even in the midst of dismay, even in difficulties uh, such as the pandemic, even in problems that happen in your church which are real. We thank you that you are achieving your purposes. We thank you for the precious blood of Christ, the one who laid down his life for our sins. We thank you that you are in control. We pray that what you have done for us in Jesus might shape all that we are and all that we do. Uh, we pray that as we meet together this morning, that as we sing your praises, hear your word, commit ourselves to you in prayer, that you would direct us uh, to your character, to you, the work of your kingdom, and that we might serve you and live for you as you have brought us to be your own. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we are going to uh, sing the praises of God. I'll hand over to our music team as we sing together, All I Have is Christ.
Well, thanks to uh, Matt and the team uh, for serving us in music. Well, as we were saying, we're going to meet our guest preacher. Some of us are familiar with him, uh, but for some of us, like myself, uh, we've only met this morning, met today. So uh, it's great to uh, have Sam with us and via technology, uh, he can be with us uh, in Zoom. Yep. Sam, um, it's great to see you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, job or ministry role in the week when you're not coming to uh, guest preach for us. Yeah, so during the week, uh, I work for Liberty Ministries, which is an organisation that supports Christians who experience attraction to the same sex or uh, gender incongruence. So I work for that three days a week um, out of Village Church Annandale, which is my home church uh, with Dominic Steele. Great. Oh, that's good. Uh, so on, on Sundays, you're able to uh, guest preach uh, for us, but um, you're also involved, I guess, in the life of Village Church in different ways? Yeah, that's right. So I'm part of a small group and I do kids ministry there um, during the week as well. So I understand, uh, so kids ministry, and uh, you've, you've also had a particular passion for youth ministry. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so before this, and I think when you've met me the last couple of times last, last year, I was still working as a youth worker for um, Cornerstone Presbyterian. And um, yeah, so youth ministry has been part of my blood for the last, I don't know, since, since coming out of high school. So working in the area, uh, serving in the area of youth. Yeah. Yeah, great. Excellent. Um, Sam, tell us about your family. So I've got my parents and I'm an only child. Uh, my parents live down south in um, Riverwood uh, area and we all came over in 1997 uh, as part of an immigration. And so it's just myself and them and um, yeah, I've got no siblings and I'm um, single as well. Yeah. Right, right. So you came from uh, Malaysia? Hong just, Kong. Hong Kong. Aha. Uh -huh, yeah, right. yeah. Yep, yep. Great. Ah, okay. Well, that's, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's good to know. And uh, the uh, pandemic has affected uh, life in all sorts of ways. Uh, what's that look like for you um, since uh, March? Well, March 22nd is when all churches had to go yeah. online. Uh, changes in ministry, that sort of thing, and now easing out of lockdown now. Uh, how's, how's the last um, four or five months uh, look like for you? Yeah, you know, John, I think it was only like a couple of weeks ago that I really realised how much lockdown and the pandemic has really affected me. I've realised, like, I've just become more stressed I've become more just, I don't like staying at home anymore. And I've just been really boxed in and I can't concentrate well. And I think a lot of people are experiencing the same thing as me as well. Absolutely. And so, yeah, it's, it's just been a time where I've had to reprioritize things so much. Work hasn't really changed that much. Um, except moving online. I still go to work uh, every, every uh, my days that I go to work, but it's really the, the mental and the social drain that, that it's, it's really affected me. Mm. Yeah, I, I think those are very uh, common experiences, yeah. Uh, as lockdown eased, uh, were you able to start to meet with people over lunch and coffee once the whole restrictions yeah started. yeah but strangely enough i don't know about you but i hear it from other people as well i want to meet up with people but then when i'm with people i'm so socially drained for some reason it's like my social capacity has has um shortened so much that yeah. when i'm not with people i want to be with people but when i'm with people i don't want to be with people it's a great paradox yeah I guess there's so much readjustment for uh, all of us, isn't it? Like mm. things have changed and it might be uh, 
a while till things get back to what we used were more familiar with. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks for that. That's um, that's uh, great to hear. Well, um, great for us to uh, get back in touch with Sam or to meet him, and we're looking forward to uh, hearing uh, you open the word for us in your sermon, as well as uh, being available for question and answers after the sermon. So we'll uh, hear from Sam a little later. Now we move to a time of announcements. And uh, there is a link for the announcements there that we can see that uh, it's easy to read through those in detail. I'll just uh, highlight a couple of them. Uh, so there's uh, the Cantonese pastoral news that uh, Pastor Deborah from the Cantonese side will be leaving earlier because of family reasons for us to know. Uh, it's very important, as we just mentioned in the interview, that the pandemic can be a difficult time for us in a number of ways. Uh, so there is support uh, here at church, uh, particularly for the women's team, the women's care team, uh, some uh, wonderful ladies there. Uh, they are very uh, keen and available to uh, talk with, uh, if you're a woman, uh, to have a uh, great personal chat with them. Men, uh, there's a number of ways as well. Uh, feel free to contact Reverend Z or myself, uh, as well as there'll be other avenues uh, with that. Uh, as we can see, the AGM is at this stage for EFC scheduled uh, Sunday 13th of September. Uh, looking to how that will be online, so more of that, but there's also the possibility of uh, nominations uh, for that. Uh, if it's on your heart to uh, step up to uh, put yourself a nomination for being a deacon, then that's also possible. Uh, happy to talk with uh, anyone about that. In a best, best, basically two weeks' time, we have the IDMC, which stands for Intentional Disciple Making Conference. So that's going to be Friday night and Saturday morning, and that's for er anyone in English ministry. Uh, so that promises to be a great conference where we'll learn lots about uh, that essential ministry of disciple making. Uh, if you'd like to register, and then do let me know, because we would like to have a uh, review or debrief session after that, where we can really share and make the most of what we've learned and see how we can, under God, see the uh, English ministry go forward. So that's very important. Uh, just a brief note about uh, electronic giving. Uh, if you would like to, please consider that. And uh, there's the uh, methods of how you can do that. And we, we recognise that uh, this time is difficult financially, uh, but also uh, our financial costs still continue at EFC. So uh, we're really uh, upheld by that. Well, now uh, we now will come to our next element, which is an evangelism spot by Leo Peng. Uh, that's one of the things we hear for, uh, each month, and that's very important as we think of uh, the expansion of God's kingdom with uh, sharing Jesus with others. So I'll hand over now to Leo. Hello, good morning, everyone at EFC. It's Leo here again. Very nice to see everyone online. And this is the monthly evangelism spot once again. I always look forward to these evangelism spots now because I think it's a very good opportunity for us to just check in to see how our witnessing for God is all going. Have you been preparing yourself just in case God calls you any time to witness for him? And if you look back and remember what we've gone through so far, so far we've looked at self-preparation, a bit of prayer, having the right attitudes when you approach someone. And today I thought we might just expand on three more things to consider and just the right attitude when we do approach that person we want to share the gospel with. The first thing is to understand that we are led by the Holy Spirit as to who we approach. We need to pray for opportunities. Pray for whether it be by chance that you meet up with someone or it's something that's planned. And when you are speaking to that someone, I'm sure most of you have maybe witnessed this, is that you have a flash, a thought in your mind. You really want to, maybe you should share the gospel with this person. And that's probably the Holy Spirit speaking to you and calling on you to spread the gospel. Sure, it's very easy to miss and never ignore these opportunities, but just be mindful. God wants everyone to be saved. And the next time you speak to someone and that thought flashes through your mind that, oh, gosh, I should speak to this person about the gospel. Do that and don't miss those opportunities because God wants everyone to be saved. So the first thing is just be mindful. The Holy Spirit is with us, with us all the time and it gives us opportunity as well. So pray for that. The second one is to make a good impression. Now, that obviously goes without saying, and this is obviously very, very important. 
You see, when you think about it, part of the gospel message is understanding that humans are by nature sinful. It is something that eventually all Christians need to understand. Now, having said that, it doesn't really help a non-Christian if the first thing you say to them is, you know, you're very sinful, you're going to go to hell unless you believe. Um, we need to be wise in our approach. And when you think about it, there's nothing actually wrong with saying that we're all sinful. But the timing is just not quite ideal. So making good impression and just saying appropriate things at the appropriate time is very, very important. The third uh, consideration that I have today is something I touched on last time as well. When you speak to someone, just be mindful that we cannot be too pushy. I want to spare with, uh, share with you a, a passage from Colossians uh, chapter 4, verse 6, because it says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Just be mindful, God has his own timing. Remember, we are messengers and messengers only. We do not have the power to save. Only God does that. So by being really pushy, it doesn't actually achieve very much. It's not really that constructive at all. And when we do spread the gospel, sure, we get frustrated when someone completely rejects the gospel when we share it with them. But the Bible said that this is completely human nature to reject Jesus. All we have to focus on is speaking out of grace and love rather than being hostile or condescending. We are messengers. We do it out of love and God would do the rest. So those are three tips that I've got around today. And I hope you found that useful. Happy evangelizing. And we look, up, we look forward to uh, catching with you next time again. Stay safe. Thank you, Leo. Now we come to a time of prayers. And uh, so we'll be uh, committing to the Lord uh, many of those things on our hearts. And this morning we'll be guided by the words of Psalm 33. So I'll be reading out parts of that uh, in the prayers. Let's pray together. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Our Heavenly Father, we are reminded by Psalm 33 of your great power. We thank you that you made the world. You sustain the world by your very word. So we're assured of your sovereign power and your goodness, even in the difficulties that we face. Thank you that you are allowing and using the circumstances though we don't always understand. And we pray that we might be reminded of your sovereign power. We would look to you as our fortress, our rock, our shield, our strength. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your care of your church, your people, particularly uh, EFCA. We do give you thanks uh, for our dear sister, dear sister Christy and her family of uh, Winnie, Stephen and Joshua. We continue to pray that you would be with uh, the doctors and uh, nurses and other staff as they continue to uh, treat her, uh, that they would be uh, skillful and prudent. We pray for the you family to look to you in your great timing for uh, healing and stability. Uh, so that life would resume and continue. We uh, give you thanks that uh, at this stage our AGM can go ahead and we pray that the details will fall into place so that that might occur in the uh, online format. Uh, we pray that uh, that would progress. We thank you also for uh, IDMC, for the uh, online version of the conference, even if we cannot meet together. We pray that that would uh, strengthen and equip us for the work of your kingdom. And we pray that uh, even in the individual difficulties that we face relating to the pandemic of uh, isolation, of changes, of frustration and difficulties that we have shared about, we pray that we would look to you for our strength. Thank you for the presence of your spirit. Thank you, you give us family and friends and church and support. And we pray there will be connections for those in difficulty, for those uh, who need that contact. And Lord, thank you that you know our needs. And we pray that you would uh, direct us to the fellowship, which will uh, build us up and strengthen and encourage us. As we've heard, we uh, thank you for 
the priority of evangelism. We pray that you would lead us to people and people to us, that we might share of how Jesus has cha changed our lives uh, and the difference that he makes in, uh, in people. Thank you for uh, that life-saving word. And so we pray that you would direct us to those opportunities, whether it's friends and neighbors, family, you'd give us the right words at the right time. Uh, and those would be directed in your purposes. Psalm 33, verse 10 and 11. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one in control of the world. And so as we think of the world, we think of it as a place that does not always know you. And thank you that your purposes stand firm. Indeed, Lord, we pray for the country of Lebanon and Beirut, so affected badly by uh, this terrible explosion. We pray that you would care in your compassion for people affected there, those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray for the government's response there and international efforts for aid, for answers, for recovery. We also pray for those countries worst affected uh, by the pandemic, particularly the US, uh, Brazil, Spain, Italy, the UK, India, and others. And we pray that in your sovereign purposes, that as the promises of the vaccine look good, we pray that they will continue all the more in your mercy and goodness. We pray that uh, that might be a needed relief to the peoples of the world. And even whilst waiting for that, or if that does not happen, that people would look to you as the Lord. We're reminded here in Psalm 33 of your power. And here we read of more verses, verse 16. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance, despite all its great strength it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Our Father, we uh, thank you that you are the provider. We thank you that you are the source of strength and hope. And we pray that even in this time that people would look to you. We think of our nation, Australia. We think particularly of Victoria and Melbourne, uh, worst affected in our nation. We pray for government responses there. We pray for the numbers to uh, reduce and fall. And we thank you also for our state of New South Wales. Uh, we pray that uh, people in our state, as well as Victoria and around Australia, will act with uh, uh, sense and thought and care in uh, how they uh, restrain themselves from not spreading the virus in following government directions, in not being selfish or thoughtless. We pray for economic measures for our uh, federal government, as well as state governments, Victoria and New South Wales particularly. We thank you for extension of uh, JobKeeper programs that can help those in financial stress. And we pray that the details would be worked out with great grace and compassion and wisdom consultation so that uh, people who are most vulnerable will be cared for. And we pray that you would be amongst your people as great witnesses to be those who point to you as the sovereign Lord, that we might be those who are affected, but those who are different because of the hope that we share in Christ. So the words of Psalm 33, verse 22, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So, Father, we commit all these things to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now we come to a time of hearing God's word. Now we'll hear from Francis, who will read out 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And then uh, we're going to hear uh, the sermon from Sam on that passage. Good morning, church. 
Today's Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is gone in a church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of armed believers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the body of our God. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you? whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is the word of the Lord. Hey friends, keep your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 6 as we look at God's word this morning. You woke up this morning and it's nearly time for church and you had a few friends over last night and you did the cooking. And the rule in the house is whoever didn't do the cooking will do the washing up. And being Asian, you don't believe in dishwashers. So, but you were so tired last night that you said, can you just get the uh, the dishes done before you head to bed? There was a grunt or something close to it by your spouse, your friend, your flatmate, whoever it was. Satisfied that it was heard, you took a shower and went to bed. And it's 8 a.m. this morning and you head into the kitchens and there were the plates left stacked in the sink. And you do that eye roll. You call out that person's name who's supposed to do the dishes and being Asian and inclined to passive aggressiveness, you point to the dishes and you say, didn't you hear what I told you last night? Didn't you hear what I told you? might be a question that you often hear at home. You might be at the receiving end of that question. Or often you might say it at work. Didn't you hear what I told you? Didn't you get what I told you? 
there's a bit of shaming in there, isn't it? Now, one of my roles uh, during the week is to sit down with ministers and Bible college uh, students to teach them how to engage with Christians who experience attraction to the same sex or who have gender identity conflict. A couple of weeks ago, I sat down with a Bible college student at Queensland and I said to them, if there's one thing you need to know when it comes to ministry with people who are sexually broken or really who are broken altogether, it's this. If there's one thing you need to know, what you know has to affect what you do. What you know has to affect what you do. What you know can't just stay in your head. It must go through your ears and into your hand. And your, it must affect your head and your heart and your hands. Orthodoxy, right knowing, must impact orthopraxy, right action, or else we become hypocrites. Didn't you hear what I told you? If our hands don't act in the way that our hearts know, then what we've become is our worst enemy. Didn't you hear what I've told you? And when we come to the book of 1 Corinthians this morning, the Apostle Paul looks at the broken church of Corinth and he looks at their brokenness and says, didn't you hear what I've been telling you all along? Don't you remember the gospel? This morning, as he looks at our brokenness as the church in Sydney, your brokenness as the church in East Linfield, he says to us, didn't you hear what I told you? Don't you remember the gospel? And as we come to our passage, Paul is going to ask three major don't you knows. Number one, don't you know that you'll be judges? Number two, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And number three, don't you know that your body is not yours? Back to my story at, at the start. Imagine you were the one who was supposed to wash the dishes, but you didn't. And you hear the words... Didn't you hear what I told you last night? You might start, your heart might start to pump a little faster. You might start to get tunnel vision. You might even start to get sweaty and your fight or flight instincts set in. Couldn't you see that I was tired as well? You do the dishes. Or you might uh, say, don't use that tone at me. Or you might flight, hang your head in shame and just go do the task. Or you could slow down and engage in another way. You could tell yourself not to react. You could tell yourself that the best way of conflict management is to engage the conflict and say, I did hear you last night. I know we had an agreement in washing up and I'm sorry that I didn't get it done. Thanks for reminding me and I'll go do it and make sure it gets done next time. When God this morning looks at us and speaks to us through his word, didn't you hear what I've told you? Don't you know 
that your body isn't yours? Why are you engaging in sexual immorality? Don't you know that the unrighteous does not enter into the kingdom of God? Why are you unrighteous? Don't you know that you'll be judges? Why are you letting conflict go abound? We're going to be tempted to react. Our hearts are going to start pumping and you might start to get tunnel vision and you might start to get sweaty and you can say, can't you see all the good stuff that I've done? Surely you can just overlook that. What about you, Paul? What about you, Sam? How dare you accuse me of this? What a bigot. Or you might just hang your head in shame and shuffle along in um, compliance. Both actions would be doing something actually wrong. We won't be doing what the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, wants us to do. We'll be actually working against what the Word of God is trying to bring out within us. Repentance, faith, love and obedience. So, as we get into God's Word, in order to get our hearts right... Why don't you pray with me? Father God, our fight or flight instincts are going to kick in when you convict us with your word. So slow down our hearts, slow down our emotions, speak with us by your spirit that we might not be right, but we may hear what is right, and become like Christ. Give give me the gentleness as I speak your words and convict me of my own sin, lest I am a hypocrite. Speak, Lord, we pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I don't like conflict one bit when your heart starts to pump and you start to sweat, when you get that tunnel vision, when someone speaks in that tone you don't like and then, or someone lies to you when you're accused of something that you didn't do or you did do, when you're backed into that corner, what do you do? What if this conflict turns into an argument and then the argument turns into something more sour? And what if turning into sour leads into disputes and finally to lawsuits. I remember when back when my parents had a major falling out with one of my friend's parents and how sad it was for me as a kid. I thought to myself, why couldn't my parents who were Christians work it out with another set of parents who were Christians as well? Surely grace and forgiveness flows in the blood of Christians. When Paul looks at the lives of the Corinthian church, there is another case of falling out, and he brings about a shocking tone to them. How dare you, he says. Have a read with me in verse 1. Does any of you who have a complaint against someone dare Go to law before the unrighteous or unbelievers instead of the saints. We're not sure what exactly happened. We're not sure why someone might have gone to the unbelievers to have a ruling over this. But that's not the point. The point is that they stopped looking and behaving like the people of God. They've lost their distinctiveness of what it means to be God's people. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? He says. Verse 3. Do you not know that we will judge angels? 
Well, Paul is asking a rhetorical question here, and his use of the Greek is expecting the answer, yes, of course. Do they not know that they will judge the world and angels? Of course they knew. They knew that they would be judges. So verse 2, why are you giving over small petty things over to unbelievers to judge? If you're going to have the responsibility of judging the world, if you've got the Bible, God's word, God's truth, God's spirit within you, why are you refusing to take up the responsibility in sorting out your own conflict within the church? What have you become? Then Paul says something that we might be a little bit uncomfortable with in verse 5. Have a read with me. I say this to your shame. Shame on you. Wait a minute. Can Paul say that? Shouldn't he be a little bit more uplifting in his rebuke? But then... What has the Corinthians church done? Verse 6, brother goes to law against brothers in front of unbelievers. It doesn't really matter who wins or loses because verse 7, it's already a defeat for you. Regardless of who wins in this law case, it's already a defeat for the people of God because they've shown the world that they're no different to who they are, to the rest of them, that they aren't living as what the people of God should be living like. Paul deliberately shames them because they have already stopped acting like the people of God. And if we believe these words are coming out from the inspired word of God himself, then God himself is ashamed of them because they've stopped acting like his people. I want to pause here for a second and just reflect and let God speak to me. We could easily sweep aside this passage and say, we don't have any lawsuits against my brothers and sisters. We didn't go to court with him or her. But in what way have we as believers stopped acting like we truly are going to be judges of angels and the world? We've got the Bible, we've got God's word, we've got God's spirit, we've got forgiveness and grace. What about that Christian brother or sister you stopped talking to because of that thing that happened that month of that year ago? What about your spouse that you've grown stagnant with because of that communication breakdown about that small thing, which was never really about that small thing, but about a bigger thing? What about that conflict with that person who you serve with, whom you've never really resolved, and then it continues to snowball and now you have heated conversations all the time? Do you not know that you will be judges of the world and of angels? Do you not know that you have God's word and God's grace and God's forgiveness? Instead, brother goes in conflict with brother, sister argues with sister, and even before unbelievers. God says, I say this to your shame, because whoever wins that conflict It's already a defeat. Are you really living like the people of God? Are your palms starting to get a bit sweaty? Your vision's getting a little bit tunneled? Your armpits tingling a little bit? Your eyes darting around? What are you going to do? 
you might be tempted to react and you might say, can't you see all the good stuff that I've done? Surely you can overlook that. What about you, Sam? How dare you accuse us of this? You might hang your head in shame and shuffle along in compliance. But then we won't be heeding the word of God, would we? We wouldn't be letting the word of God transform us by the spirit of God. So what are you going to do when you walk back home from your car? Are you going to call that friend or just ignore everything that was said? Are you going to start that conversation with your spouse or just give them the death stare? You have the spirit of God within you. Don't you know that you will be judges of the world and of angels? Sort out your conflicts in a Christian manner. As you might know, as I said before, during the week, I work as a ministry worker for Liberty, an organisation that provides pastoral support for Christians who experience attraction to the same sex or gender incongruence. Every time I preach and I engage with a church, I'm aware that there are those who are listening in our midst who experience these things. And if, and if you want to reach out for support and have a chat, please come and contact me. Because when we get to the middle of our passage this morning, we come to a passage of a little bit of shaming that is an anxious passage for many. It's often called a, clob, a, a clobber passage because it's used to clobble those who are gay as forever broken, defiled and twisted. And for some of us, we come to this passage scared and intimidated because it describes our experience. For some of us, we come to this passage armed with what we know as God's truth against wrongdoers. And for some of us and many of us, we just don't know what to do. I remember a certain footballer posting this passage online and causing a scandal that no sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. What are we to make of this passage? Do we start to get sweaty, tunneled vision? armpits tingling? Do we start to get militant with our placards of pro-marriage? Or is the passage about something else? Follow the text with me. Let's see. We've just seen verse 1 to 7 has shown us that the Corinthians are shamed because they're not dealing with conflict as God's people should be. Verse 7, it's already a defeat for the church. They should have already put up with, they should just put up with it with injustice and be cheated. But verse 8, instead, you are the ones who act unrighteously and cheat. Then verse 9, Paul uses the very same words. Do you not know that those who are unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Can you see what Paul is doing? He's saying that you should be the ones receiving unrighteousness, but you are the one doing the unrighteousness. And don't you know those who are unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God? He's not clobbering uh, those outside of the church, Paul is hitting the hammer on the church of Corinth herself. He's not clobbering unbelievers. He's using the passage to clobber the Corinthian church. Corinthians, you are the ones who are doing unrighteous things. Don't you know that those who are unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Of course they knew. Then why do they keep doing it? Why do they keep doing it? And then suddenly, the text turns around and God is now speaking directly at you. The Church of EFCA East Linfield. Friends, are you engaged in sexual immorality of any kind? Are you idolizing anything? Money, your kids, your grandkids, your spouse, your car, your family, your bank account, your handbags? Are you adulterers? Are you engaging in homosexual activity? Are you thieves and you steal? Are you greedy with your money? Do you drink a little bit too much alcohol? Do you speak bad words against people? Do you swindle and cheat other people? Friends, EFCA, don't you know that these behaviours belong to unbelievers and not the people of God? then why do you keep doing it? Are you any different to unbelievers? Are you in danger of receiving the punishment and the wrath of God? Are your palms starting to get sweaty? Are you starting to get tunnel vision? Are your eyes darting around? What are you going to do? You might be tempted to react and say, what about that guy over there? Just have a look at their behavior. Look at all the good stuff that I've done. What about you, Sam? How dare you accuse me of this? But then we won't be heeding the word of God, would we? We wouldn't be letting the word of God transform us by the spirit of God. Notice how Paul finishes this section of the passage. Verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Corinthians, those at Linfield, at EFCA, you have been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified, such were some of you. You've been cleaned by God, you've been made white and sinless, you've been made right with God through Jesus. It's okay. It's okay now to be convicted by sin. It's okay that at one time you were deep in sexual sin, deep in pornography, deep in alcoholism, deep in cheating and idolatry and anger and greed. But right now, don't run away. Don't stand up and fight. Fall into that grace that has been given to you by God through Jesus Christ. Be enveloped by those hands pierced with nails. Throw yourself into the grace of God because such were some of you. I want to pause here for a second and address those of us who might feel the weight of guilt bearing down upon us, especially hard, especially those who are watching this, who've grown up with unchosen and enduring attraction to the same sex. When Paul here talks about homosexuals in our translations, he doesn't mean orientation. 
it doesn't mean attraction. He's talking about action. We shouldn't be guilty for things that we shouldn't be guilty for, but we must repent of the things that we must repent for. Maybe some of you've engaged in sexual activity in the past, but such were some of you. You've left homosexual activity behind. So friends, if you experience attraction to the same sex, keep walking that faithful walk. Keep fighting that good fight. Keep being obedient because you have been washed, you've been sanctified, and you've been justified. Listen to what Wesley Hill, professor of New Testament, writes about his own unwanted sex, uh, sexual attractions. He writes, my homosexuality, my exclusive attractive attraction to other men, my grief over it and my repentance, my halting effort to live a fittingly in the grace of Christ and the power of the Spirit, I am learning to view that all this, my journey of struggle and failure and repentance and restoration and renewal in joy and perseverance, it's what the Holy Spirit is doing to transform me on the basis of Christ's cross and his Easter morning triumph over death. He sees his same-sex attraction as something used by God to sanctify him all the more, to love Jesus more. You are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified. And indeed, the final part of Paul's letter speaks to all and everyone who have been sexually immoral, Don't you know that your bodies are members of Jesus? Don't you know that when you sleep with someone, you're joined to them in one flesh? Don't you know that your body is a temple of God? Why are you then sinning sexually, whether in person or virtually? Flee, run away. It doesn't even say test your limits. And it doesn't even say see how far is too far. It just says flee. Verse 19, your body isn't yours. Verse 20, you've been bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Friends, what are you going to do? Are you sleeping with another person who is not your husband or wife? Are you using your body in sexual ways that are not God glorifying? Paul says to us, and indeed God speaks to us and says, flee from it, run away from it, because with the Lord, you are one with him in spirit, in verse 17. I was attending a conference in the States for ministry with same-sex attracted Christians, and there was a talk on sexuality, and the speaker said something really profound. He said, We are people who surround sex with such taboo. We don't like talking about it and we don't like discussing it. It creates this shame when we try and bring it up that we don't even confess sexual sins. If it's so taboo, how open are we with God? about our sexualities? How open are we with God about our sex lives? If we want true intimacy with God, are we inviting God into our deepest, darkest areas and asking him to do a sanctifying work in it? When we are stuck in fantasy and sin, Are we inviting God and in acknowledging his presence that he is there even in the most ugliness of parts? That his grace abounds 
and that in the person of Jesus, he has washed and cleansed and made us anew? Or do we shut God out? If we do, aren't we doing the very same thing as believers, unbelievers do? Didn't you hear what I told you, says Paul? Don't you remember the gospel, says God to you in East Linfield? Are your palms getting sweaty? Are you getting tunnel vision? What are you going to do? You might be tempted to react and say, can't you just look over these things? Surely, God, you've seen the good things that I have done. You might hang your head in shame, but then we won't be heeding the word of God, would we? We won't be letting the word of God transform us by the spirit of God. How are you going to respond this morning? Let's pray. Father God, you are good beyond all thought, but I am vile, wretched, miserable, blind. My lips are ready to confess, but my heart is slow to feel and my ways reluctant to amend. I bring my soul to you, break it, wound it, bend it, mould it, unmask me, unmask to me sin's deformity, that I may hate it, abhor it, flee from it. All these sins I mourn, lament, and for them cry pardon. Work in me more profound and abiding repentance. Give me the fullness of a godly grief that trembles and fears, yet never tr ever trusts and loves, which is ever powerful and ever confident. Grant that through the tears of repentance, I may see more clearly the brightness and glories of the saving cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh
the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who call upon His name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will. online church um, hope you're having a good time um, in service so far today uh, we do have another interview after having a bit of a break last week um, i've got two guests joining me today one is probably a familiar face to you um, especially given the service we've already had uh, one is a less slightly less familiar face um, so if my guests would like to um, appear and now and show themselves hi john hi lika Thanks for joining us this Hello. morning. Morning, morning, church. <laughs> um, as all of you are joining, this is actually pre-recorded, given that John is now at church leading the service. Um, so we're yeah, really thankful to be also joined by Lika. Um, so maybe to begin with, um, could the two of you first introduce yourselves, um, just so yeah, for those who might not be as familiar with you. Well, uh, I'm um, I'm John, I'm the uh, yeah, um, pastor. Yep. So I uh, basically was born in Singapore, and then I came to Australia when I was two. Uh, so I'm very Aussie Chinese and uh, very a Sydney boy. So yeah, I uh, grew up went to Epping Boys. Uh, we live in Epping at the moment. Uh, yeah, so I've um, gone through a long life journey of studying social work, working as a social worker. Uh, then uh, leaving to do ministry training, more college, uh, becoming an ordained Anglican minister, being in Anglican church ministry, uh, more recently a aged care chaplain, and then coming to EFC. So yeah, it's been an exciting journey. Hi, I'm, I'm Lika. Um, I was born in Indonesia. We migrated to Australia when I was 16. And um, yeah, I went to Sylvania High, um, and then to UTS and I studied business and then I worked for quite a number of years before um, deciding to um, do a ministry training and that's where we met. Um, yeah, and then I did one year of college uh, with John. Um, yeah, and then just, yeah, we've been in ministry together, I suppose, since then. Yeah. Great to hear. Um, and it's lovely to get to know yeah, the two of you a bit more as we will um, in the next few questions as well. Um, so we know it's been a time of immense change in the last few months. Um, and you know, we've heard a bit about, you know, I guess what, what, um, what John does during the week as our pastor, but um, could you both tell us, I guess, in a bit more detail, how your week of work looks like and how that has changed? Uh, for me, um, I've, I suppose even in lockdown, I have continued to go to um, church and the office, uh, though that's just varied uh, week by week. So, yeah, I guess um, I've visited uh, cell groups via Zoom, whereas in normal times I would be physically visiting people. Uh, and being there in their living room, sitting there with them. But Zoom has been more people online on screen. Yeah, so I think that that's been a change to, in terms of relationships and getting to know people. It's been a more online version. 
uh, as, as things started to ease then started to meet up with people more over lunch and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's been the nature of things in a way. Yeah. Yeah. For me, um, what has basically moved um, to online uh, working from home since middle of March. Um, only recently I have to start going back to work one day a week. So I've only been back to the office twice <laughs> since then. Um, yeah, our office has um, basically um, been very proactive since beginning of um, February. We started talking about working from home. Um, so we were well um, equipped when the government decided that people should start working from home. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's been it's been working out quite well um, with technology now. Yeah, we're doing meeting by Zoom, um, you know, phone calls by Skype. Um, yeah, everything's been been working well, and I'm really thankful to God that we can you know work from home. Yeah, mm, definitely, definitely something to be thankful for. Um, so as well as work and ministry changing, um, of course, family and schooling um, have also had to make adjustments at this time. Um, so what does that look like? I was um, thinking, yeah, what does that look like for your family? If you wouldn't mind sharing in the past few months and what do you think God has taught you through that? Um, yeah, I suppose initially when the children have to um, learn from home, and we also have to work from home. That was quite tricky. I find um, it's a juggle having to spend time helping, especially Josh, because um, he's younger um, with his work because he doesn't understand things. It's a new experience for everyone. Um, so that was quite challenging. Um, and we all were really pleased when school <laughs> restarted and we can send them back to school. Mm. Um, I think I just appreciate so much more what teachers do. <laughs> um, yeah, and we, we're really thankful to God that um, compared to a lot of other countries, Australia have it quite mild. Um, yeah, definitely something that we're thankful uh, to God for his protection. Um, so far, you know, in our immediate circles, we don't know anyone who's, who's sick, yeah. Mm, yeah, definitely give thanks for that. Um, thanks for sharing a bit about family. Um, we might go to our usual last question then for the interview segment. Um, so what would be one piece of encouragement you want to leave with the congregation watching online today? I guess um, uh, more and more, I guess, in my um, devotional time, I read through the Psalms, I actually end up reading some of the Psalms uh, each day as part of the uh, routine. And it's amazing how the Psalms look to God as the rock, the fortress, uh, the shield. Uh, and the people of God are really open with just sharing uh, sadness, anguish, difficulties, all of those things. And that's just such an encouragement of us being real with God, uh, bringing the concerns of our hearts to him. Uh, yeah, so I think in all the different circumstances, I, I, not that uh, they're going through the pandemic exactly the same as we might, but there's a lot of parallels and similarities. So I think that um, really looking to God as our strength and our hope and being real with him, and that's just so important. That's just part of the, the experience of the people of God. So I think that um, whatever is going on for us to really uh, pour that out to God, share, share that and look to him for strength and the fact that even in the dark times as the psalmist share of uh whether it's just being oppressed frustrated uh feeling like there's just they just can't keep going on uh, there's there's hope uh looking to god uh, looking to him not running away from him so i think that that's just uh, a wonderful thing that uh, i'm reminded of um, day by day um yeah i suppose for me Another reminder that God is in control, that we have plans, but he has a better plan. We might not understand why the pandemics happen, but because we trust that God is good and that he's in control, then um, we know that something good will come out of this, um, whether it means that we're learning to trust him more or whether it means that we you know, learn to depend on him more um, and realize that we are not in control of our life, but he is. Um, yeah, so 
just as I always reminded of um, Isaiah 55, God, God's plan um, is higher than our plan. So I think, yeah, again, learning to trust him and be patient as we wait for the pandemic to um, get over. Yeah. Mm, definitely. Um, thanks for sharing those reminders from us. Really helpful from both Psalms um, and Isaiah. Uh, just, yeah, your experience over the last few months. Um, we wish we could be with you in person, um, especially since, you know, your family's only joined our church since February. And then we kind of, like you said, um, yeah, in lockdown from March. Um, but hopefully there will be lots of future lunches and in-person cell group meetings. Um, yeah, and church yeah. gatherings to come. So, yeah, thanks for serving us as well um, so faithfully throughout these last few months, even in the difficult times, and for sharing with us um, today a bit about family life and, um, yeah, home life as well. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there for today. But thanks again, John and Lika. Thank thanks, you. Therese. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank thanks. Well, thank you, Therese. Uh, that interview was just coincidental with me um, chairing, but uh, it's uh, great to uh, meet different people of the congregation. Now we have a time of question and answer, and uh, Sam's been uh, very happy to uh, stay and to uh, answer some questions. Uh, Sam, we have one main question here. How would you practically flee from sexual immorality? Do you have any helpful tips on how to go about doing this? Yeah, I think it's a tricky one and it's a tricky one that we don't really talk about as well because sometimes um, something so private, we, instead of even just fleeing, um, we just give in to temptation. We're, we're not aware of temptation and we don't actively think through what temptations there are. So I think firstly, it has to come down to the heart Right. Um, you can have website blockers, you can have uh, rules and stuff, you can have accountability, but it's down to your heart. Like I talk to a, a lot of people and who, who struggle a lot um, with their sexuality. And one of the first things is I can't really help them. I'm not a counsellor, but I can't help them on their journey unless they're ready to be helped unless their heart is wanting to love Jesus and put Jesus as Lord beyond everything else. Um, that's, that's the starting point. And then from there, I think as we are working through these things, one of the most important things then is to think through what is triggering my temptations? What are the main things that are really firing away at me? And let's, let's with, my, uh, with, with the help of the Holy Spirit, let's name them for what they are, name the sins, name the temptations, and let's flee from them. Not flirt with them, but flee from them. Speaking uh, uh, in a context of, say, a dating couple, right? There's always the question, how far is too far? When in reality, when you're already starting to ask that question, you're already letting temptations rule um, your dating life, as opposed to saying, How's, what's the most God-glorifying way to live my dating life? And so I think that that's right. So helpful tips, get your heart right. And that's only through the work of the spirit. Get your heart right. Then slowly work through what are the temptations and then get an accountability partner. You can only work through some of, the, some of these things. And, you know, one John says that expose your sin into the light and I think not only is that exposing it to God and repenting, but it is exposing to a community of believers who are going to help you live a godly life as well. Mm. Yep. Um, excellent thoughts, uh, Sam. Thank you for that. Um, 
just to follow up uh, on what you mentioned in the sermon, uh, if anybody wants to uh, reach out and make contact with you, uh, is mm. email a good method? Yeah, the best, best way to reach out to me is email, which is ministry at liberty.sydney, ministry at liberty.sydney, or you could go to our website, liberty.sydney, um, www.liberty.sydney, and you can contact us there. And um, either way, it will come to me um, privately um and i'll be able to answer your uh, any any questions or thoughts or if you need to have a sit down and have a chat excellent um that that sounds great uh, just uh another um uh comment uh yeah thank you sam for working us through this passage and for challenging us that what we know must affect our action but to firstly remember god's grace so that's um that's a great affirmation uh, this morning yeah uh, so that is, um, I think for time, we might leave it there. I think there's one or two questions coming in and I'll let people make contact with Sam or if there's an option of um, Sam answering those and getting back to us. Uh, but in terms of time, uh, we should finish up. Uh, let me uh, lead us in prayer as we uh, close our service. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these great words that even in difficulty and brokenness, that we are not our own, that we were bought with a price. Thank you that we have been washed uh, and sanctified, justified because of our Lord Jesus. Thank you for the hope. Thank you for the positives that we have heard, uh, the power of the Spirit to uh, want to live your way, and then not just the negatives. And we pray that you will indeed empower us. We thank you for Sam and his uh, ministry. We pray for your blessings upon uh, that ministry as he helps people in need, as you direct him uh, for your purposes. We pray that we as a community will help each other, help us to have this culture of honest and open discussion of sharing together, helping each other, that we might live for your kingdom uh, and uh, live as people of Jesus, uh, day by day. And this we pray in his name. Amen. Well, uh, we thank you again for uh, your fellowship and encouragement. And uh, yes, it's uh, it, it, that's the close of our service. So I uh, hope to uh, see you or have contact with you during the week. And uh, we'll say bye for now. God bless you.